Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 174, The Economic Recovery. Between 540 and 740 AD, life for a Roman farmer was about as miserable as it gets. Plague, invasion, depopulation, raiding, taxation, occupation, eviction, you name it, they suffered it. Thankfully, the first of those nightmares, the plague, began to abate as the 8th century wore on. The 9th century saw defences improve and raids become less devastating, and now the 10th and early 11th centuries, for large parts of the empire, have brought peace. This means that the population grew, more land was cultivated, more trade took place, and more money was made. As usual, our historians and archaeologists have to work hard to uncover definitive evidence of this. Byzantine sources remain thin on the ground. So here are a few examples of the work that's been done to shed light on the empire's economy. The first are the kind of major surveys which we discussed in our interview with John Halden back in episode 130. By studying plant pollen and carbon dating other organic matter, we can uncover the use of the land in different parts of Romania. These surveys show the expansion of Byzantine settlements across this period. Wooded areas were cleared and pasture land was cultivated. Across Greece and the coasts of Anatolia, we see the growth of arable land and the reappearance of man-made structures. A good example of this was discovered at Nicaea. As some of you know, Nicaea was built adjoining a large lake. And back in pre-Byzantine times, the Romans created an artificial outlet which contained the lake on its western side. This allowed large areas of good farmland to be reclaimed from the waters and settled. But the outlet had to be continuously maintained or it would silt up. During the 7th century, this is exactly what happened as the population of the area dropped. By 1025, the local authorities seemed to have got to work and reopened the channel, allowing the land to once again become productive. Other constructions that we know of tend to be the more traditional kind of building work. Archaeological projects at places like Ankara and Amorium show the expansion of those sites. While many churches and monasteries founded during the past century survive intact today. There are more of them in Greece than Turkey for obvious reasons, but many of the famous rock-cut churches of Cappadocia date to this time, as do a series of ecclesiastical buildings across the Balkans. I've put up a few pictures on the website to give you an idea of the building boom which accompanied the growing wealth of the provinces. The economic recovery also encouraged a greater circulation of coins throughout the empire, particularly in the expanding cities. At Corinth in Greece, to take one example, a survey found only 20 copper coins dating to the 8th century, then 150 just for the reign of Theophilus in the 9th, before unearthing over 2,000 with the name of Constantine Porphyrogenitos and his family. Similar ratios have been found at other sites. Finally, we actually have documents at last. To give a broad generalization, there have been no Byzantine financial papers available between Justinian's day and now. But from the 10th century onwards, the records of the various Greek monasteries kick in. These collections of transactions and legal disputes are invaluable and come largely from the various monasteries on Mount Athos. These institutions were able to survive the fall of the empire and continued to function under Ottoman rule. 
They therefore preserve information about Byzantium that can't be found anywhere else. From these documents, we discover that the government sold off large tracts of land during the 10th century. This largely concerns Greece and Thrace, which were freed from Bulgar raids after the peace treaty of 927. So, for example, in 941, officials in Thessaloniki put up thousands of acres of land for sale at relatively cheap prices. The monasteries were quick to step in and pick up some bargains. Here we see the reclamation of land in action. Fields that had been abandoned for 30 years could be claimed by the government. Thessalonian officials then looked to find new owners who could settle the land and make it productive. They weren't trying to turn a profit, they were trying to find responsible landlords who would eventually provide tax revenue, hence the cheap price of the land. The monasteries of the Holy Mountain were ideal purchasers in this case, since they could afford the tax bill, while waiting for yields to recover. Thanks to the work of diligent scholars, then, we can see the Byzantine economy expanding throughout this period. And the growth in the rural population did lead to a renewed occupation of urban spaces. But we should be careful to understand what this process meant in 10th century Byzantium, because although the empire's cities began to grow again, they did not resemble their ancient predecessors. And what I mean by that is that when we think of ancient Greco-Roman cities, we tend to picture large buildings and public spaces, theatres and amphitheatres, forums and agoras. But these were not necessarily features of every ancient city. Egyptian, Persian, Chinese cities looked quite different. The design of classical Roman cities was a conscious choice. They were designed to preserve the Hellenistic-style city for ideological reasons. The ruling class of Greece and the Roman Republic came to see city living as the ideal of civilized behavior. But that ideal was no longer relevant. It had been under attack ever since the Roman Republic had begun to crumble. The reason city living was idealized was because elite men had all gathered in one place to make collective political decisions. Once the bureaucrats of empire took over the decision-making process, the elites were no longer incentivized to live an urban life. They could live just as comfortably on their country estates, and far more peacefully. In Byzantium, the elites did actually gather in one city to be close to political power, but this was, of course, Constantinople. A magnate might own vast estates in Anatolia, but he resided in his mansion on the Bosphorus. He needed to be around the palace, jockeying for position and maintaining his state salary. So although wealth was invested in the provinces, it was generally directed to improve agricultural yields rather than build public amenities in a city. That ethos was long gone. The cities which began to emerge in the 9th and 10th centuries were more like fortified markets for the surrounding rural population, a space where farmers would go to buy and sell, attend church, and hear news from the capital. During harvest time, many of these places became ghost towns. Of course, there was a good deal of variety in the shape and function of these cities depending on their location. Coastal towns were busier and less dependent on the harvest, while cities which were also theme headquarters would enjoy a larger permanent population of officials, soldiers and clergymen. But many towns, particularly in Anatolia, were more like fortified villages than what we would think of as a city. Somewhere between 1,000 and 6,000 inhabitants providing basic defence and market functions for the rural community of the surrounding area. One of the reasons that many cities didn't grow any larger 
was the role of Constantinople within the Byzantine solar system. The capital functioned like the sun, with smaller towns and cities orbiting it, economically speaking. Constantinople was such a huge market and producer of goods that many cities existed merely to facilitate its needs rather than develop their own independent, rounded economy. A Rydestos in Thrace became the emporium for grain sales to the capital, while Abydos, Kizikos, and Pili became customs posts for merchants sailing the Marmara. In Asia, towns like Nicomedia, Prusa, and Nicaea became collection points for livestock and other produce heading from Anatolia to be sold at the capital. Now, no one in these places was complaining. Many were growing wealthy, facilitating these transactions. But if the primary purpose of your town was to hold livestock while it was being counted, then your urban planning would look quite different than that of your ancestors. And in most of these places, there was no point in developing a local manufacturing industry. Uh, most household goods could simply be bought from the workshops of the capital. Cities which developed a more varied economic character were situated further away from the Bosphorus. Trebizond, the major Byzantine port in the eastern Black Sea, or Atalia, which dominated the trade of south-central Anatolia, to take two examples. Both were plugged into foreign exchange networks, allowing locals to live off trade. Inland, we know that Amorium grew to service the needs of the central Anatolian population, and given the expense of bringing goods over land, native industries grew up there, producing glazed pottery and glassware. The urban areas we know most about, thanks to a series of archaeological projects, are the cities of Greece, which went through a major economic expansion during this period. Greece was well served by its location. The plain of Thessaly provided ample grain to feed its people, and its jagged coastline forced the merchants of Venice and other Italian cities to stop over on their way to Constantinople. This allowed several cities to develop native industries which flourished during the 10th century. Possibly the wealthiest of these was Corinth, thanks to its two harbours, one accessing the Adriatic and the other on the Aegean. The centre of town has been well excavated and shows a thriving industrial area with pottery workshops, glass factories and metal workers side by side. Other buildings suggest apartments, taverns and large storage areas for food. Corinth also had a silk industry, the profitability of which had been a major driver to plant mulberry bushes across Greece and the coasts of Anatolia. The bushes fed the silkworms, whose produce then grew an industry of dyers, silk workers, tailors, seamstresses, and cloth merchants. Thebes, the thematic capital, had also invested heavily in silk production, as had Sparta further south. Greek ports like Patras, Methone, and Argos thus became important nodes linking these centres of production to the capital and the west. Athens was expanding too, but doesn't seem to have been as commercially profitable. Unlike the dense build-up at Corinth, a large area of agricultural land was included within the city's boundaries. This was more similar to life in much of Anatolia. Though the town was growing, it was primarily a trading post for the rural economy. Still, profits from the land could be immense, and the large collection of churches and monasteries which survive today in the Athens area testify to that. Listener GT asks how the expansion of the economy would be experienced by the individual farmer, particularly in light of the growth in power of the magnates? Good question. The collapse in the Byzantine population had allowed lots of productive farmland to be abandoned. 
either trees and forest would grow over it, or it would simply turn into pasture land, grass and other common species growing higgledy-piggledy for animals to consume. When we talk about the expansion of cultivated land, we literally mean that farmers came in, cut down trees or burnt forest away, cleared the land, planted crops, and in many cases simply claimed the land as their own. Or in cases where the government was working efficiently, as we saw at Thessaloniki, the land was sold to farmers who would go through the same process. Naturally, those with more money were in a better position to acquire and transform land. On Mount Athos, for example, canals were constructed to bring water from high up the mountain to the monasteries below. But initially, at least, there was more than enough land to go round, so that even poorer villages could clear land and claim it without their local bigwigs intervening. Over time, though, the sources show us the ability of the rich to get their way. When using the term magnate, we've tended to focus on the eastern military commanders. But the government's legislation on the subject did not make this distinction. Instead, anyone receiving a government salary was warned not to take advantage of their poorer neighbours. For example, we know that the monasteries could be extremely aggressive in expanding and protecting their portfolios. In a series of cases documented by the records of Mount Athos, we see a monastery expand its holdings at the expense of the local village. This is between, say, 900 and 980. First, the monastery is granted tax-free status thanks to its imperial connections. The profits from this are used to buy flocks of animals, but they have to be grazed on the neighbouring village's land, and the monastery has to pay a fee for this. Twenty years later, the fee has been removed. Now the monks are encroaching on the village's land further, and the citizens are forced to uh, get into collective action with the local theme judge to enforce their rights. Thirty years on, and the monks are again encroaching on the village and bringing legal action themselves to claw compensation from the villagers for using land that once was part of the village and is now the monastery's property. So over the course of that 80-year period, the monastery broke up the village community by buying land and changing its use. Repeatedly, when called in, local officials supported the villagers' case, but a generation later, the better resourced and connected monks had found a way to expand their holdings again. Their possession of legal know-how, meticulous records, and imperial connections were too much for the locals to resist. And monasteries acted with a cloak of righteousness covering their actions, at least in the eyes of officials who didn't know the details of the dispute. It's important to not draw too many conclusions from one example, and the monastery wasn't trying to turn people out of their own homes, and was doubtless a source of employment for many villagers, but you can also see the way in which the rich got richer. As you know, the government made various attempts to curb the excesses of this behaviour, and it's unlikely that they were very successful. But at the same time, there is little evidence that the expansion of the uh, office-holding class did much damage to the Roman state. The rich getting richer is a dynamic common to most societies, and the Romans had been here before. Pre-Byzantine law codes tackle the same issues of rich landowners putting pressure on smaller ones. The rich were always a threat because they could pay off tax collectors, or hide young men from army recruiters, or lobby to avoid various state impositions. But when an effective emperor was on the throne... Tax collection could be enforced and privileges revoked, as we saw under both Nicephorus Phocas and Basil II. When I introduced the magnates, I overstated their political significance. I followed the line of 20th century historians in implying that conflict between this class and the government would have serious consequences for Byzantium. I no longer believe this to be the case. And hopefully the narrative and 
our interviews with Anthony Caldellis has led you away from this conclusion. The rebellions of Bardas Focas and Scleros were only successful when they had troops gathered under their banners, ready to be led. In other words, when the troops had been assembled and paid by the government. Only then could a Stratikos present a real threat to the emperor. On their own, even as extremely wealthy individuals, they had no chance of leading a rebellion. No magnate had the kind of money that could pay thousands of soldiers' salaries, let alone all the other logistical support the army needed that we discussed a couple of episodes ago. Nor did any borderland family have enough kin or retainers to form the core of an army that could rally support against the state on the scale that would be needed. Nor were regional loyalties strong enough to foster this kind of rebellion, Um, They just didn't exist in the way that they did in Western Europe, where peasant farmers depended on their local lords for protection. In Byzantium, the state dominated affairs. They taxed your lands, and they paid your salary. They always had done, and peasant and general alike largely obeyed this logic. Even the most acquisitive monastery or magnate remained in thrall to the government, If they abused their position too much, they could be cut down or cast out. Scant comfort for the villagers being put under pressure, but from the point of view of the state, the rich getting richer was not a major crisis, nor would it play a vital role in the collapse that's to come. The economic recovery must have contributed to the military success of the empire over the past century, but it doesn't seem to have made a dramatic difference. The Romans outnumbered their enemies on each front and would have been capable of beating them in less buoyant times. We also saw that under both Nicephorus and Basil, the state's finances began to creak under the weight of annual campaigning. The empire was still operating in pre-modern financial conditions. The state couldn't take out loans to cover its expenses. The Vasilefs relied on enough tax being collected to pay the army. When the empire was facing one opponent at a time, the system was manageable. But if multiple opponents attacked at once, the Byzantines would struggle to face them all down. We saw this in the narrative, when Basil had to march from Bulgaria all the way to Antioch to fight the Fatimids. And it's situations like that one which will greet the empire when our narrative resumes. It's important for you to see that the economy can be booming at the same time that the state struggles to defend itself. Many listeners asked questions about the economy and we'll tackle one of them right now. But two of our Kickstarter backers also asked for more details about population growth, demographics, and Roman roads. So, in a couple of days' time, I'll release another Backer Rewards episode, and it will be like an annex to this episode, and I'll answer all the economy-based questions that we don't get to today. Listener A.R. asks whether the Empire had any big brand companies that might make uh, wine or armour or other types of product. I actually answered a similar question recently on a Backer Rewards episode about the institutions of the Empire. As you can imagine, mass production was not really possible in the way that we're used to it today. Nor was there much opportunity to brand certain products, given the way that things were stored. You wouldn't have a bottle of wine, for example. It might come in a jug, poured from an amphora or other receptacle. Nor was there the same motivation to have branded products, because so many consumers were too poor to have any choice in what they purchased. However, there are exceptions to this that are worth considering. The case of armour is an interesting one. At various times during the Empire's history, military equipment was made in government warehouses, 
and either issued to or sold to the soldiers. So in those cases, there were doubtless workshops that produced better gear than others, which could well lead to conversations about where one could get the best armour. Similarly with wine, though branded vineyards didn't exist as such, certain places were renowned for producing better wine. The grapes of Euboa, Chios, and Rhodes were all favoured, so offering guests a wine from these places might draw approving noises, suggesting the brand of the area was strong. The same goes for Cretan cheese. And indeed, the monasteries of Mount Athos produced goods which they exported to the capital, including wine. Presumably, some consumers would have favoured the goods of such a God-blessed location. There were also several Byzantine products which were favoured overseas, uh, and silk was clearly the most sought after. Uh, imperial demand, both for the royal family's use and to give as gifts, drove the industry to a high level of technical accomplishment. And we know this because imitation Byzantine silks were sold in both Egypt and Sicily, just as knockoff handbags are today. Again, uh, Roman silks is how the products were known to foreign merchants, at least as far as our sources tell us. Um, it's possible that particular workshops in the capital or in Corinth could have gained reputation, but that's beyond our understanding. And uh, I think in that case, most people just referred to them as Roman silks, and so can't really be counted as a brand in the modern sense. That's it for today. Coming soon is the Backer Rewards episode with questions about demographics, the road network, and lots more about Greece. And then our next full episode will introduce the Seljuk Turks. <laughs> <laughs>